morning. morning. Welcome. We're so glad that you could uh, join us this morning on this uh, July 4th uh, Independence Day weekend uh, as we celebrate the uh, gift of God's Word and uh, the Sacrament of Communion. Uh, we want to make sure that everyone knows uh, whether you're a member here or just visiting for the first time, everyone is welcome and invited to take uh, both the bread and the cup um, as part of our communion service. Uh, the way that we've been doing it uh, most recently is we're inviting everybody, uh, once uh, I do my part uh, behind the table, uh, I'll invite everyone to kind of come towards the center aisle uh, to receive the bread from me and then to return to your seats uh, on the side aisles. And as you go back, uh, you'll see um, uh, Meg and Gary, our uh, ushers this morning, are going to be holding the trays of the uh, little cups of juice. So uh, you can receive the bread from me and then get your... Uh, the, the communion uh, juice uh, from Gary and Meg, and then return back to your seats. Um, want to uh, thank Gary and Meg for being our uh, ushers this morning. Want to thank uh, Kitchi for being our uh, worship leader. Uh, it's always wonderful to have uh, Kai uh, here on piano. Uh, also want to give uh, thanks to, uh, often gets unnoticed, um, but Bill Bond and uh, Don Gushel uh, have been preparing the communion elements um, for a long time, and uh, we're so uh, fortunate that they're willing to do that and uh, on a monthly basis uh, have that all ready for me uh, when I arrive on Sunday morning. It is a great uh, thing and very uh, thankful that they could do that. Also, uh, you're in for a treat this morning uh, because Phil Stepanski and uh, Tracy Brennell are going to be sharing um, a wonderful special music with us this morning, One Bread. One Body, uh, such an appropriate song uh, on this communion morning, especially when you hear, I think, the uh, scripture passages. Um, I think it also speaks to that song as well. Um, just a couple of announcements this morning. Want to, uh, uh, in the bulletin, you'll see a recap, um, kind of a very brief outline of what took place at the uh, congregational meeting, which took place last Sunday after the worship service. Um, we, uh, we accepted or voted and approved a new slate of uh, officers. Uh, we uh, uh, accepted the reports of um, all the different teams and officers in the church. Uh, Phil and uh, Kathy uh, did a wonderful uh, presentation of uh, the church's finances. And um, we also talked about the possibility uh, coming down the road of a capital uh, building uh, campaign. So uh, a lot of things going on, um, but all good, uh, wonderful things, and we're very excited um, about the upcoming, uh, this summer and fall, and all that's going to be happening. Um, also, one last thing, I want to invite everybody on Tuesday night, we're starting uh, at 5.30, we're going to be starting a series of barbecue Bible studies. Um, you all know we have this beautiful patio uh, outside of our fellowship hall. Um, I'm going to be cooking... Uh, hamburgers and cheeseburgers this morning. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not, it's not gourmet. It's going to be quick and easy um, because it's me. It's going to be quick and easy. Um, I'm going to Costco. I'm buying like the big thing of cheese, frozen burgers. They're delicious if you've ever had them. Uh, but whoever shows up, that's, you know, if you want one or two cheeseburgers or hamburgers, I'll throw them on the grill. We'll cook them up. Uh, we're inviting people to bring um, a salad or a bag of chips or a dessert or anything that they would like to share and um, we will eat and then have a little um, Bible study. Uh, we're looking at the Gospel of Luke. Uh, the Gospel of Luke is a, one of, again, one of the four Gospels. It's uh, an amazing book. It has a lot of very, uh, uh, some of the things that we most recognize about Jesus' teachings are only found in the Gospel of Luke. For instance, the, good, the parable of the Good Samaritan, which you guys will be uh, um, hearing about next Sunday, um, that only appears in the Gospel of Luke, but it's got a whole bunch of those kinds of things. And so we're going to look at the Gospel of Luke in particular um, and have uh, fun, fellowship, a little bit of study, and uh, get everybody out of here by 7.30. So I uh, hope if you are able, if you're free, please do come. Uh, you don't need to reserve your space. Uh, just, just come on out and it should be a, a nice time together. Um, let me uh, close this uh, announcement by just lifting up some birthdays and anniversaries. Um, on the 6th of July, Violet Nelson celebrates a birthday, and on the 7th of July, we have two birthdays. 
Jennifer Dimmer and Luis Mullinger, or Mullinger are having birthdays. And then on the 9th, uh, Jane Schneider celebrates a birthday. If you see any of these folks during the week or correspond with them by phone or email, please do reach out and wish them a happy birthday. Uh, this coming week, we have two anniversaries. Today is uh, Bruce and Donna Lobbs. It's uh, their anniversary. And then on the 6th of July, Brad and Peyton Katzer are celebrating their anniversary. So again, we wish all these folks happy birthdays and happy anniversaries. Um, let's begin or continue our worship service with the piano intro.
for we need healing. We come to you for we need healing. We come to you for we need healing. And as we gather around the table of the Lord, we need healing. As we gather, as we sing, as we pray, as we listen, as we speak, may we open ourselves to your law, your blessing, your word. We give thanks and praise to God. Amen. more when all he said to you was, wash and be clean. So he went down, immersed himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. His flesh was restored like the flesh of a young boy, and he was clean. Our second reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, verses 1 to 11, then 16 to 20, and it can be found in the New Testament on page 7. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him to Peter to every town and place where he himself intended to go. He said to them, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out the laborers into his harvest. Go on your way. I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. Carry no purse, no bag, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. 
health, in the same health. Remain in the same health, eating and drinking whatever they provide, for their labor deserves to be paid. Do not move about from house to house. Wherever you enter a town and its people, <coughs> you eat what is set before you. Cure the sick who are there and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not welcome you, go out into the streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off in protest against you. Yet know that the kingdom of God is near. Whoever listens to you, listens to me. And whoever rejects you, rejects me. And whoever rejects me, rejects the one who sent me. The 72 returned with joy, saying, Lord, in your name, even the demons submit to us. He said to them, I watched Satan fall from heaven like a flash of lightning. Indeed, I have given you authority to tread on snakes and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing will hurt you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice at this, that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven.
Thank you so much. That was uh, beautiful. Let's uh, be together in a spirit of prayer. Gracious and loving God, thank you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for the words of Holy Scripture. Thank you for beautiful music that stirs our souls. Thank you, God, for your presence with us and for sending us your Son. We pray this day that all of these elements of worship, along with the sacrament of the bread and the cup, might work together to form to mold, to shape us into the disciples that you call us to be. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Kitchi was uh, right in that these uh, two texts are, uh, uh, they've got a lot going on uh, within them. Um, Jesus sends out the disciples into the world um, I think that that text, uh, at least for me, it, uh, it, it, it calls on me, it challenges me about risk-taking. Um, the disciples are going out there without any supplies to rely on, uh, to fall back on. Uh, but they're really called to step out in trust, a willingness to risk for the gospel's sake, to willingly to purposefully put themselves out there in a way that makes them vulnerable. And I think also the passage from 2 Kings, uh, there's a lot of those same elements. When you think about uh, the, the people who are involved, uh, it seems like those who are on the lowest end of the power structure are those who are most willing to take a risk for justice, for healing, for love. Those who are the most powerful are the least willing to take a risk. They're the most prideful. They, they feel that they can't risk because they have so much to lose. And so these, these texts challenge me to look at myself and, and say, like, well, where am I in that? Am, am I willing to risk for the gospel, to, 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 to risk Forgiveness for somebody who might turn around and hurt me again? Am I willing to risk love for somebody that might turn around and hate me? Am I willing to open my heart to somebody and know that I could be hurt? I think that's what part of what discipleship is all about. I think that's what bringing Jesus' message of love and peace and hope is all about. Our willingness to take those kinds of risks in the relationships that we have with one another. In the risks that we take in relationship with those who are beyond our uh, communities, the communities that we're most comfortable with, folks that look and sound and act and have the same similar experiences as we do. Are we willing to step outside of those safe barriers? Let me just focus in on the story from 2 Kings, because it is a fascinating story filled with uh, um, unexpected twists and turns. Naaman is an Aramean general. This Aramean general has been very successful in war. And in fact, war against the Israelites. The king over Israel, there are a lot of Old Testament scholars that think, in fact, that Naaman, the Aramean general, is the one who is responsible for the current king of Israel's father's death, the previous king of Israel. So it is Naaman who had conquered the Israelite army and killed the current king of Israel's father. You can see why when this triumphant general appears in the Israelite court with a letter from the king of Aram and saying, here is my general, cure him of his illness. You can see where the king of Israel would take that as like, this guy's trying to pick a fight with me because who can possibly do this? 
But we know the backstory. We know that Naaman, though the mightiest general in the ancient world, has a skin disease. You know, it doesn't matter how high and powerful and talented and on top of your game you get, stuff happens that you don't have any control over. The mightiest general in the ancient world has a disease that will cause him to be cast out, isolated. It may not be leprosy the way that we understand leprosy, Hansen's disease today, but it is some kind of skin condition that was so feared in the ancient world that he would have been ostracized. So Naaman is upset, he's worried, and it is his a woman in his household who had been taken against her will from the Jewish nation that he had conquered. This woman was the spoil of war, a slave in his household who took care and helped care for his wife. This unnamed slave girl thinks to herself and must have said out loud to her Master, or mistress, if only Naaman could present himself, because there is a man in Israel who could heal him of his disease, a man of God, a prophet. So Naaman, in his desperation, will appear, appeal even to this defeated nation, he goes to the king, his king of Aram talks about this holy man in Israel, and that's when the king of Aram sends him to the king of Israel, because certainly the king of Israel would know all about the holy man of Israel that would be able to cure this kind of disease. Again, historical background says that the king of Israel probably did know about Elisha, although claims ignorance. The reason is, is that Elisha and Elijah, remember last, last Sunday we told the story of Elijah, the great prophet, uh, uh, passing his mantle of authority onto Elisha, who we're talking about today. Well, Elijah, in the midst of his ministry, had set him up in opposition to King Ahab, the one who was killed by Naaman, the Aramean. So King Ahab, the current king's father, King Ahab had brought in foreign gods through marriage to a woman you all probably have heard of, Jezebel. Jezebel brought with her uh, the foreign gods that she had worshipped in her own homeland, because those are the gods that she grew up with. Of course, she's going to bring those gods with her into Israel, and of course, Israel reacts with great negative uh, uprising, and Elijah gets into a terrible feud with Ahab and with Jezebel. And it is Elijah who predicts that Ahab will die in battle and that his line will come to an end. So even though the current king of Israel knew, knew about Elijah, knows about Elisha, he doesn't want to use Elisha's power because Elisha is on you know, the opposite side of the aisle, as it were. He's the loyal opposition, loyal to God, but not just loyal to the king. So the current king of Israel does not want to send the general, the victorious general of a foreign army to a holy man who is kind of a rival. And yet, in the midst of his own, the current king of Israel's uh, own distress about uh, if he doesn't do something, this could be a, the beginning of a war. Elisha intervenes and sends him a letter and says, I've heard about Naaman coming to you, send him to me, that he might know that there is a holy man in Israel. So Naaman goes, and uh, he goes with a, a great, I mean, you can imagine the pomp and the, uh, uh, the, 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 the parade of uh, things that went with the general of uh, the Aramean army. 
Uh, but when he shows up at Elisha's home, Elisha doesn't even come out to greet him. Elisha sends his own servant down to the door to answer and say, go and wash yourself in the Jordan River seven times and you will be clean. Now, for somebody who's traveling with all this pomp and all this uh, honor guard and all these, uh, uh, you know, to show how rich and how majestic and how powerful he was, that Elisha himself won't go down and tell him this himself or go down and, and make some grand gesture or, or act uh, suitably uh, 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 honored by all of these things. Naaman heads out of town because, because he's not been received in the way that he expected. He expected to be given honor, to be expected to be lifted up, to be praised. And instead he's just given a simple directive. Naaman, in his own pridefulness, is unwilling to do what the holy man of Israel that he had sought out in the beginning asks him to do. Aren't the rivers of my country just as powerful, just as mighty as the Jordan River? And then again, it is Naaman's servants who come to him. The ones who probably have the most to risk by asking the most powerful general in the ancient world to change his mind. Saying to him, if, if Elisha had come out and asked you to do some terribly difficult thing, you would have done it. Why not all the more if he just asks you to bathe in the Jordan seven times? And so Naaman hears their voices, hears what they have to say, and he follows their directive. He washes himself from the Jordan seven times, and his skin is like a newborn. His disease is cured. Now, Naaman is not a man of faith, right? He doesn't believe in the Israelite God. He's just come to receive healing from this holy person. And yet, uh, we have the, the verses through verse 14 of this chapter. If you go on to verse 15, it talks about how Naaman recognizes the gift that he has been given. And he believes, he converts to Judaism. It is the act of God's mercy prior to his faith that then allows Naaman's faith to blossom. And he believes in the God of the Israelites. Think about all the, the risks that have to be taken for this miracle to take place. The risks of a lowly slave girl. The risks of the servants. The risks even of Naaman himself. Though he is a mighty general to put aside his own ego, to take up the position of humility and humbleness, to receive the blessing of this holy man of a defeated nation. The thing that I thought was so nice about uh, One Bread, One Body uh, being sung this morning in worship is that our understanding of who God is, our understanding of who we are called to be, is that we are all included in that love. Uh, it's the words of Paul. He talks about that no one is beyond the love of God, Gentile or Jew, slave or free, male or female. It takes, though, all of us being willing to risk being with one another. In this story, we have slaves who are willing to speak love to their master, to their mistress, to the ones who have all the power. And yet they're willing to 
risk. The, the men are willing to listen to the women. The Jews are willing to listen to the Gentiles and the Gentiles to the Jews. It is only when we all humble ourselves, when we take our, our egos and place them to the side, that we are really able to experience the love that God has for us, for me, for all of you. God's grace and God's love is available to all of us when we are willing to open our hearts, open ourselves to step beyond the boundaries of safety. And even though we know sometimes we may get hurt, to trust that God will be with us and lifting us back up. Because you know the, the text at the end of that Luke passage where the disciples have to shake the dust off their sandals? It's because risk sometimes means pain. The, the pain of rejection, the pain of being denied, the pain of being hurt. But the actions of the disciples, the example that they set for all of us, is a willingness to wipe the hands, wipe the dirt from our feet, and to try again, to risk again, to open ourselves again, to be vulnerable with one another again. And God will bless us. Let's uh, share together um, our second hymn, uh, Jesus, the Joy of Loving Hearts. <laughs>
Uh, we have an opportunity now to share uh, joys and concerns before our uh, pastoral prayer. Um, invite uh, anyone who likes to uh, uh, lift up a joy or concern that they'd like to share with the congregation that we all might uh, share in our prayers. Are there any uh, this morning uh, joys or concerns that we can lift together? Um, I'll lift up just a couple that came in uh, this morning. Uh, many of you know uh, Lou Kagi, um, who's a longtime member of the church. Uh, she called and uh, wanted uh, us to uh, lift up for her um, a few uh, family concerns. Uh, first, she wants us to know about uh, her granddaughter, Shelby. Um, uh, Shelby, on Tuesday, is going to have uh, surgery. Um, she'd uh, been diagnosed with uh, breast cancer, had been receiving treatment, and uh, now they're going to do uh, surgery. And so she invites our prayers for Shelby. Um, she also wanted to lift up uh, one of her other uh, grandchildren, Tim. Uh, his wife, Christy, um, has been experiencing, uh, uh, she's been living with lupus uh, for many years, and uh, she recently, in the last uh, week or so, has been having very high fevers. And uh, so she's inviting us to uh, pray for Christy. Uh, that uh, they might be able to diagnose and see what uh, what's going on that she's uh, uh, been experiencing this, and then uh, to make matters worse for Tim, and, worse for Tim and Christy, um, their daughter Kylie um, has uh, some breathing issues, and uh, all through the past couple of years of the pandemic has been uh, the whole family has been very careful um, and cautious with COVID. And uh, she was just beginning to uh, get back out, and she had been doing some babysitting and uh, found out that the whole family that she had been babysitting for the children, uh, the whole family now has uh, COVID. And uh, so she's had a, had a big exposure, and they're just praying that, <clears throat> uh, that she doesn't uh, come down with it. So uh, prayers for Kylie, uh, great-granddaughter of, of uh, Lou, and then uh, for... Um, Tim's wife, Christy, and for Shelby. Um, all of those from the KB family. Are there any other uh, joys or concerns that we can uh, share together this morning? Yeah, go ahead. Um, have you heard anything about how Bruce's uh, sister is? It, yeah, thank you. Um, I, I did see uh, Bruce this week. Um, and I saw him just as he was about to uh, be transferred over to uh, Heritage uh, here in Port Washington. Um, so Bruce is going to be there at uh, Heritage um, for at least the near future. Um, and uh, I think that he's hoping that uh, he might be able to get back home. Um, but, you know, everyone is kind of unsure about uh, uh, how strong he will be able to, uh, uh, what kind of strength he'll be able to regain. Um, but uh, many of you might have known Bruce's mom. Um, she lived at uh, Heritage for many years, and Heritage is also convenient that Donna can get over there and visit. Um, so, uh, so he feels good about being at uh, Heritage for at least the near future. So um, I know that he would welcome uh, visits and cards and calls and all that stuff. So. You know what he used to do, which was really nice? He would Yes, yes, no, and uh, uh, thankfully Don and uh, uh, Bill have uh, picked that up uh, from Bruce, so his, his ministry continues uh, here in the church uh, through, through them, so, but yeah, uh, and we miss him, uh, he used to, he was a real regular at uh, the Wednesday uh, lunch groups as well, and uh, we, we, we miss... used to do dishes together, a really, <laughs> a really nice man, yeah, he is, he is, he is very sweet. Uh, but yeah, your, your prayers for uh, Bruce and for Donna uh, would be very much appreciated by them. Yeah, Diana. Um, my sister Gail, who's a year older than me, has lupus, and mm -hmm. she's really almost living at the hospital now and, and trying to get to come down there. Mm. So another one with lupus. Has she had uh, been diagnosed with lupus for, for a while? Quite a while. Yeah. So she, she knows what, how difficult it can be. Yeah. Thank you, Diane. We'll lift up your sister, Gail. 
Anything else this morning? Let's be together in prayer. Gracious and loving God, we come before you in a spirit of prayer, seeking your Holy Spirit. We have so many reasons to be thankful, so many reasons for praise. The beautiful world that surrounds us, our friends and family members who gather together in times of celebration like this weekend, also gather together in times of sadness and grief. We thank you for all those people near and far away who offer their support and their compassion and their care, who share their prayers and their presence. Folks, we know that we can rely on God. We give you our thanks. We know, God, that we're not always the disciples that you call us to be times when we get so caught up in our own concerns and worries that we forget about those around us. Even the ones we love the most, we can become forgetful of. God, help us to know in the deepest place in our hearts that we are your beloved, that we are granted the gift of grace that your forgiveness is greater than anything we could do or leave undone. This morning, God, we lift to you those that we have named this morning, Gail and Bruce, Kylie and Christy and Shelby, and Lou, their grandmother and great-grandmother. We pray for those who are not named, but nevertheless remain upon our hearts and our minds. Individuals dealing with grief, families dealing with conflict, folks who are awaiting diagnoses, those who are recovering from surgeries and procedures, those who are undergoing therapies. God, we pray for each one. We pray that they might know your spirit's peace. Pray that they might know the light of hope and the courage that you can grant in times of difficulty. Help us, God, to be your hands and feet at work in the world. Help us to have the strength of faith to open our hearts and our minds to one another. To be vulnerable in stepping forward, risking our love, risking forgiveness, risking mercy and compassion, risking that the world might know a little bit more healing this day and every day. In the silence of our sanctuary, God, we pray that you would hear us as we lift to you our silent prayers. Hear us as we pray. God of grace and of glory, we thank you for turning towards us. We pray that you would hear us as we lift the prayer together that Jesus has taught all of his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At this time, our ushers will receive our morning's offering. Let each of us give as we are able, according to the blessings which God has already given to us.
pray. Loving God, we thank you. We thank you for all the gifts that you have given to us, and we give you our thanks and our praise that we are able to share a portion of them with your church. We ask your blessing upon the gifts that we have given. We ask your blessing upon all those who are gathered here. We ask your blessing that these gifts might be used to strengthen and nurture the people of faith here and throughout the world. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, I invite you to be seated for this portion of the worship. In Luke's Gospel, we read that Jesus sat at the table with two of his disciples, took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized the risen Christ in the breaking of the bread. In the Acts of the Apostles, we read that as the church was gathered often in the homes of believers, Christians devoted themselves to the Apostles' teaching and the community and to the breaking of bread into prayers. Jesus Christ, we believe, is the bread of life, and we gather at Christ's table to know him in the breaking of the bread. Would you please join me in the communion prayer? God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to God Most High. Holy God, we praise and bless you for creation and for the gift of life itself. We give you thanks for your abiding love, which brings us close to you, the source of all blessings. We thank you for revealing your will for us in the giving of the law and the preaching of the prophets. We thank you especially that in the fullness of time you sent Jesus, born of Mary, to live in our midst, to share in our suffering and to accept the pain of death at the hands of those whom we loved. We rejoice that in a perfect victory over the grave you raised Christ with power to become sovereign in your realm. And we celebrate the coming of the Spirit to gather your church by which your work may be done in the world, and through which we share the gift of eternal life. Gracious God, we ask your blessing upon this bread, upon this fruit of the vine. We pray that you would consecrate these gifts. We pray that you would bless us, that as we receive them at this table, that we may offer you our faith and our praise, and that we may be united with Christ and with one another, and that we may faithfully continue in all things. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Remember that on the night of betrayal and desertion, Jesus took bread. He gave thanks to God for the bread, and then he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the disciples had eaten, Jesus also took the cup. And he poured it out for his disciples, saying to them, This is a cup of a new covenant in my blood. Share this as often as you would in remembrance of me. Ministering to you now, in Jesus' name, we give you this broken bread, this cup of a new covenant, a covenant of love. Come, let us celebrate this meal together. We thank you, God, for inviting us to this table where we have known the presence of Christ and have received all Christ's gifts. We pray, God, that you would strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and let us show forth your praise in our lives. All this we ask. 
Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. After the disciples had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And so too, let us close our worship by singing our closing hymn, which is uh, uh, number uh, 347 in the uh, Black Hymnal, Let Us Talents and Tongues and Boy. Uh, each time through, we'll sing that refrain twice. There's a repeat, so we sing the, the last line twice each time. Thank you.